right. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. It's great to see you. Love the weather, how it's gotten a little cooler for us, so that's awesome. We had a great men's retreat uh, just uh, yesterday and the day before, so that was terrific. Thank you guys for coming, if you were part of that. Loved it. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you have chosen uh, VineyardChurch.com and, and our online service to be part of your spiritual journey, and we believe God has a uh, good news for you and has a word for you. And we are in week three of a series we started called Your Truth Matters. We believe that, that your truth dictates a lot about your approach to life, your, uh, your, your emotions, how, how you react to people. It's a big part of that. That's why we're wanting to see life from God's point of view. God's perspective, not just the human perspective. And sometimes, actually, our way of seeing things is not actually right. It can be distorted. It can get messed up, maybe from you know, our, our upbringing or things that have happened to us, things we've read. I mean, not all. that's why we're talking about truth. When we buy into things that are not true, they start impacting us in negative ways. And so we want to kind of recalibrate that. And that's what we've done is just taken this, this series to say, let's take these... Th- these next, you know, these weeks to recalibrate and say, what is truth? Now, truth, if, 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 when, if you have an untruth in your life and you identify it, you got to pull it up by its roots. Many times in our society, we try to cover up stuff. We just have, we put band-aids on things, but it's, you got to go to the root. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I had, I had a weed in my yard, my backyard a number of years ago. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm not going to pull it up. I'm just going to, I was mowing when I saw it, you know. And I thought, I'm just going to mow over it. So I just mowed it. A few weeks later, it's back. And so I mowed it again. And then it became like a battle. I refused to dig it. I refused to pick it, you know, uproot it. Now it's a tree. So it's years later. Sharon and I look at it every morning when we have coffee and we look out. There's our weed that thinks it's a tree. Now it's too late, though, because it's like huge. It's like it's not part of our life. We're like this weed that, that we didn't deal with properly. And uh, it's not a tree. It thinks it is. And well, you know what? It's like that in our life. We let things go in our life, and, they, and they, they keep growing. And next thing you know, they're dominating a piece of our life. Well, the world has approaches to try to uh, fix world problems because you know, we live in a broken world. There's all kinds of problems. And so some of the, now there's more, I didn't list them all. There's hundreds, certainly probably thousands of approaches. Here's some of the top ones though that you might be aware of. One would be political. Like some people view uh, the world like there's a law for everything. You change that, you change public policy, and, uh, and, and that'll make the world a better place. And you take God out of the equation and really you're left with just laws. Just, you know, just try to make as many laws as you can. Better laws make for a better society. And that's really salvation through legislation is what I would call it. Just like you can legislate all kinds of things. The problem with that is, is a law doesn't change a human heart. It doesn't change the character. It's like the little kid stood up in the classroom and the teacher was, hey, you know, sit down, Johnny. And the little kid goes, no. And the teacher goes, I said sit down. Little kid, no. And so the teacher says, sit down before I knock you down. Now, they wouldn't do that today, right? That's, we're going old school here. <laughs> sit down before I knock you down. The little kid sits down, and then he yells out, but I'm still standing up inside. <laughs> That's the way we are, right? I mean, you can legislate, and you can certainly Laws will make people conform, but they don't change prejudice. They don't change attitude or character. That's why it's not a, it doesn't pull it up by the root. There's something deeper, something deeper. Now, the, uh, another approach is education. All problems, some people think, it's just a matter of ignorance. It's just a matter of education. If you get people educated, get them taught, you get them learned, then the world would be a better place. Now, education is wonderful. I'm highly committed to education. Sharon and I, early on, before we started uh, 
uh, the church before this. Anyways, before we were like, you know, starting one of our churches and during that, we owned a education center that was here for a number of years. We taught remedial uh, education, mostly to kids, some adults, and it's still going on today. We donated our business to a local uh, school here, a Christian school, and many, many people, thousands of people have been uh, helped over the years. Sharon and I both have a master's in education. We love education. We're all, we're all in on it. But education by itself does not pull out the root problem. Now, by the way, Christians, because as a, it's, it's part of what it means to be a Christ follower is to, is to be all involved in education, to love it. The first, at the first universities in the United States, Harvard, Princeton, uh, Yale, were, were, were started by Christians. Most, most hospitals throughout the world were started by Christians. In almost every country, the first hospital was started by a, a Christian. And, and it's all over the country. So we, as Christ followers, we believe in education, just not salvation through education. It is, it, it's not really a root issue, although... Ignorance is a problem. We do want to address it, but we recognize that education alone doesn't do it. You know, some of the tyrants and the terrorists and uh, criminals and dictators, some of them are the most educated people of all. Didn't help them. So education by itself uh, is not enough. Then material. In other words, if I just have uh, enough things, then my, I'll be a better person, right? If it's, if they see, some people see is everything is in economic terms, financial terms. And, um, you know, the goal is just to, you know, put money in that direction or throw money in that way, in that direction. The United States has spent billions of dollars in humanitarian aid and helping countries often with no results at all. Because when you give money to a corrupt government, they just steer it to you know, line their pockets or, you know, when we give money to Pakistan, a lot of times that money, it only goes to Muslim constituents. And uh, you see, finances alone does not do it. Salvation through compensation. And now I'm all for helping the disadvantaged, people that are in a place of hardship, people in, a, in economic uh, uh, difficult times. That's why we have our food page. We've had it from day one here at the church. That's why we've had many, many ministries where we help out at people in need and, and uh, you know, all kinds of ministries. We, we, we go to Mexico and help out the poorest of the poor there. We're committed to that, but we also recognize that there is a limitation to finances. Now, in our worldwide, Countries often have to decide, are we going to be socialist or, you know, with socialism is, is it's in, its, in its most basic form is everybody owns everything. It's completely shared. Nobody owns a business. Businesses are, are, uh, are, are governed and owned by all the people. And everything shared equally is the, is the way it's proposed. It never happens that way, of course. And then other is capitalism, and that's kind of the free market. You can own your own business. You can, you can in your own effort, your own creativity, try to better your economic uh, situation, your economic circumstance. Regardless of what approach you take, it doesn't solve the root problem. Wealth alone is not enough. If it was, then the wealthiest people would be the happiest people, and that's just not the case. So another one is through, psycholo- through psychology. Help people to change the way they feel about themselves. Help them to work through their issues in their past, maybe through their relationships, their self-esteem. This is salvation by actualization. In other words, the whole goal of life is to just, you know, make you feel good and have no stress. Um, hello? That, that, that is not the way to approach all of life. If you're a Christ follower... And you pray and hear directions, like God might say, I want you to go in this direction. You know what that might involve? Not always feeling good and having some stress. You might be going straight into a headwind. And then often, you you know, we can question ourselves, is this God's will? Because it doesn't feel good. Well, you know what? Sometimes it doesn't feel good. That doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. You know, one of the mistakes that parents make often with teenagers is they'll say, oh, I just want you to be happy. That's not a good thing to say, because sometimes 
they're not happy, and then they think there's something wrong with them. Sometimes you're not happy. That's just the way that, you know, that's the way that thing happens. But it doesn't mean that you weren't created for a purpose and that you're supposed to be doing something with your life that's significant. Then there's uh, sociological. In other words, if I just change the social structures. You know, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of activists that believed that. Some of them were Christians. that They thought, if we could just change the sociological structures and salvation by association, and, and, and what, you know, what was interesting is it didn't help. There was more, I mean, you had six million Jews killed with Nazi Germany. And it was some of the worst times in, our, in, in history. And the, a lot of the, the talk of the day and globally was this issue of changing the social structures. Then you have biology. That's what some people are, are putting all of their hopes in is, is that if we can just focus on the human body. And there are a lot of exciting advances, right, with genome, g- genome editing, stem cell research. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are going on. But, but some people are banking on, hey, if we can just, you know, through organ replacements and maybe even human cloning so they can do a job that I don't want to do or whatever. You know, I mean, there's this idea of, in biotechnology, there's a pill for every problem. You're not happy? No problem. We've got a pill for you. You have anxiety? No worries. We've got a pill for you. Oh, you're building a tolerance? No problem. We can double the dose and add another pill. I mean, there's, it's always, you know, there's a, some kind of medication, something we can do to help with that salvation by medicines. Everything's solved through medicine. Then there's technology, right? And this is going gangbusters with the Internet at first. And now AI is all the rage. AI is going to change the way we do uh, agriculture. It's going to change the way we do architecture, security. I mean, across the board, there's a lot of people that they see that as the great savior. It's going to help with space exploration, on and on and on. And they're, they're, they're hanging their hat on that. Salvation by, by innovation, by technology. All of these, not the root cause. Not long-term change. What do we do if we really want to address the issues that are plaguing the world? And that's biblical. Biblical. Salvation by transformation. God is interested in changing who you are. Your character. The Bible talks about it as having a change of heart. Having a change of heart. God specializes in that. Taking a prejudiced person, making them a loving person. Taking a hateful person, making them a kind person. Taking a self-centered person, making them an unselfish person. These are the things that God does, and it starts in the heart. Here's a great Bible verse that kind of shows you what God is attempting and what he can do if you let him. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So here he makes the direct connection that it, the wellspring of life, the things that you really want, things you were designed for, what makes you fulfilled in life, what ultimately satisfies you, what brings you purpose is connected to what's going on inside you, the root thing, the heart. And that's why God always starts there. The heart of the problem is always a problem with the heart. You're not going to change the world. You're not going to change society until we change the heart. That's why when, what we're doing here when we join together and we advance the cause of Christ through the local church, we're addressing the big issue, the big issue. Never, ne- and that's why Satan also knows, hey, I don't want people to come together. I don't want them to be in unity. I don't want them to advance the gospel. And so he does everything he can to try to keep you from being highly involved and active in a local church. Because this is the hope of the world. This is the root cause. There's other things that are important. I'm not saying they're not important. This is the root issue. Because we live in a fallen world. This is a broken planet. And unless we address the, the heart issue, then we will just not really solve what needs to be happened. But we do have heart disease going on. All of us. It's, it's humanity. And, and we need to resolve that. Here's, what, here, here, here's really the four types of heart disease. First of all, is guilt. We just feel guilty. Why? Because nobody's perfect. Everybody's messed up. We've all screwed up. 
We don't, I don't measure up to my own expectations, much less, much less God's expectations. I've disappointed me. I don't even have to check in with God. I know, he, you know, like I've totally screwed up with him. And I can ask people around me. I mean, we're just, we're a mess. And so we end up walking in life with guilt. And here is a truth. It is impossible to feel bad about yourself and good about yourself at the same time. It's impossible to feel happy and guilty at the same time. Those clash. And so when you have guilt going on, there's desperate attempts to find happiness, to find something to, to be, ha- you know, to celebrate and to, to, you know, pick yourself up. But, but there's always an undercutting what's going on. And so we end up feeling worthless. We don't feel good about ourselves. I mean, we, we can try to go to counseling, and I've talked to people who have gone to counseling for decades. And there's, you know, if, if you're looking for, uh, there's a lot of work there, right? <laughs> there's a lot of work in, in, in psychological counseling. If, and especially if, if, if in non-Christian counseling where they don't often address the root cause, that's a good income for years, you know what I mean, right? They're, they're things are, because you kind of, the goal with Christian counseling, in my opinion, is to work yourself out of a job, is to help them to resolve guilt issues, not live with it. David said this, he said, I was so swamped by guilt, I couldn't see my way clear. I love how honest David is here, so honest. I had more guilt in my heart than hair on my head. Now, that's not hard for some of you, but... I'm on my way, though. I can say that, right? And the guilt was so heavy that my heart gave out. You cannot feel good and guilty at the same time. We end up feeling worthless. But the good news is that God has an antidote. He has help. Jesus took my punishment. He took my punishment. Everything we did yesterday, today, will do, he paid for. That's amazing. And he paid for it. You know, have you ever noticed that when you go out to dinner... When somebody else pays for it, it tastes better. <laughs> like, you know, like, hey, I'll pick up the check. No, no, I got it. No, no, I, you know, seriously, I got it. Okay. <laughs> you think, this meal was delicious, man. I love it. It feels, it tastes better. And, and, and it's true. God paid the whole thing. It feels better. To deep down know, man, God made me and he loves me. He wants a relationship with me. He made me for more than just living a life trying to work through my guilt. Look at this Bible verse. It says, it was our weakness he carried, talking about Jesus. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. He was wounded and crushed for our sins. He's talking about how Jesus paid the price, the bill for our sins. But he was wounded and bruised for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. Talking about the cross, that Jesus was crucified and here's why, not by accident, not because he, he was a martyr or something. It's because he was paying something. He was lashed and we were healed. We, every one of us, have strayed away like sheep. We who left God's paths to follow our own. Yet God laid on him the guilt and sins of every one of us. That's what that was all about on the cross. He put your guilt that you would live with and make decisions and it ends up disrupting us and handcuffing us and sabotaging us, all on God. Because the three words that each one of us, deep down, if we're honest, long to hear is, is, I'm forgiven. And that's what God says to you. He wants to say to you, you are forgiven regardless of what you've done. Because it was all placed on the cross. You know, one of the most paralyzing emotions is guilt. I read a study that said hospitals... Would, half of the people would walk out of hospitals all throughout uh, our country if people could just resolve once and for all their guilt and their resentment because it affects us. It affects us psycho- psychologically but also physically. Guilt is what I've done to others, resentment, what other people have done to me. And it has a negative impact on your life. When you carry guilt, how did Jesus forgive you? He did it instantly. He did it completely. He did it freely. And he says, I do not condemn you regardless of what you've done. That sin was placed on Christ. That's why it's amazing love. Now, the second problem is compulsion. 
compulsion in your life where you know you should do something, but you don't do it. Or you know you shouldn't do something and you do it anyway. Now, that's actually called addictions. But none of us, like, right, addicts are over there and then there's us, right? (laughs) None of us have addictions. We might have proclivities. We have propensities. We have compulsions that, and they happen to last for decades. But it's not an addiction, right? I go on that diet and I go off. You know, I try to say I'm not going to explode in anger anymore, but it's not my fault they put pearls in front of me, you know, and, and, you know, it's not, you know, and and we find ourselves powerless to change. That's what a compulsion is really all about, is this feeling like a victim, feeling like I don't have any power. And so we are suffering from guilt, and then we have compulsions, habits that I can't change, and I don't have power to change. Now, the Apostle Paul speaks so clear to this. I lo- this is a longer passage, but follow. Look at how Paul takes the time to detail what it means to feel powerless in a compulsion. Here's what he says. What I don't understand about myself. Now he's talking about us, but hey, hey, wink. He's talking about us too, right? He's talking about himself, but it certainly is our lot. He says, I don't understand this about myself. I decide one way, but then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. So I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it. It becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. I need, I need outside external things to help me because I, I'm broken inside. I have no power. But I need, he is identifying, I need something more. I need something more. Well, let's see what he says. If the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. Can you be that honest with your own self? I, uh, I realize I just don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyways. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong. The human condition. There's something broken in all of us. He says, something is wrong deep within me. He's talking about the root. There's a root cause that no amount of legislation or psychology is, or, or, or money is going to solve. And it gets the best of me every time. So he goes on. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Now listen, he's speaking to some of you. Some of you are so frustrated with things going on in your life. You, he's talking your language. He's saying, man, that's me. I'm at the end of my rope. I've tried it all. And when people try to help me, I say, I've already tried that. Yeah, I've done that. I'm, what you're saying is, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't seem to have power. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Good question. Good question. The answer is, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you've, if you've seen what Christ can do, it's a moment of celebration, certainly. He acted to set things right in my life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Compulsions cause me to veer off, and I feel helpless. So there it is, guilt, then compulsion. Now the antidote is Jesus bought my freedom. He bought my freedom. I was not free. I was Without power, I was trapped. And the Bible talks about that as being in slavery. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. He's talking about being set free from slavery. So stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. You go, hey man, I'm no slave. What do I need freedom from? Great question. Look at what the Bible says. You are a slave to whatever controls you. See, by God's definition, we're all slaves to something. 
You might be sl- slaves to your peers. Whatever they say is, you don't even want to do it, but you do it. You might be a slave to your schedule, to work. You might be a slave to your past and memories that hang over you. You might be a slave to guilt or resentment. You might be a slave to desires and lust. You could be living for the approval of others, and that is what you're a slave to. You could be a slave for the approval from your parents or from a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a boss or whatever. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is what is it that controls me? What is it that controls me? What's getting the best of me? It says, Jesus gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This, the Bible refers to this as being redeemed, a redemption. In other words, you and I were slaves and God paid the price. What does that mean? Well, I want you to kind of picture this in your mind with me. You're, you know, you're in one of those marketplaces back in the day, back in the day when slavery was, was, was commonplace. Actually, slavery was commonplace in the Bible days. And you're in the market and there's people are selling all kinds of stuff, right? They're selling clothes and vegetables. Well, in the center of the market is the slave block. And here they're going to be selling slaves. And for you to really get this, picture yourself, you're on the slave block. You're one of the ones that is going to be sold into slavery. So you're standing there, your turn is up. The auctioneer starts bidding a price for you. People are raising their heads. Every time that somebody bids on you, you look over and you look into their eyes and you see, you know, that they're just... They're, you're just a piece of property. You're not a person. They're just going to use you for their own purposes. And so you wonder in your eyes, I wonder what they're going to do. It doesn't really matter. It's nothing good. And the price keeps going up and up. Finally, it starts to peter out. The, one of the last people has, has gone. The auctioneer is starting to slow down. And somebody stands up. And they bid a thousand times more than the highest bid. And you look over and you look into their eyes and you realize... They're not there to use you. They're there to set you free. And the joy that would come from that, that's what Christ did when he died on the cross. That's what he paid. He paid and covered it way and above any kind of thing that would keep us captive. Now, you know, it's interesting that when people come to the realization what Jesus did for them, sometimes we try to pay him back. Well, he did so much, I got to pay him back. I mean, that'd be kind of like on, you know, after Christmas is over and all throughout the Christmas season, you, you collect all the cards, all the little tags, and then wrote down what was given to you. And then at the end, you think, okay, I got to pay everybody back now because they gave me all these gifts. And so you're writing, you know, Vemnoing or however you, you know, going to pay them back, putting money in cards. I got to pay you back. Thank you for that gift. I mean, that's absurd, right? That was a gift. And yet people try to do that with God. You know, I'm going to live a life trying to pay you back. No, we live a life of good because of what he did for us, not to pay him back. That's what makes us fall into legalism. That's what makes us fall into where we have no joy in service because we're still going to mess up. We're still going to make all kinds of mistakes, but we live knowing I have been set free. Here's the the third problem is alienation. We feel disconnected. We feel disconnected from all kinds. We feel certainly far from God. You know, he's a million miles away. Uh, when I pray, it just feels like it's a hitting a brass heaven. Nothing's happening. I certainly don't hear him speak to me. I don't sense his love. But it's true with people, too, where we feel disconnected from one another. I don't feel close to somebody. I don't, you can be married and not feel very close. You live in the same house. You're a long way away. And I talk to dads that say, I wish I had a closer relationship with my kids, it's so strained. Children that say, I wish I had a better relationship with my parents. You see, sin and evil are rampant in the world. And they, uh, what happens with sin and, and evil is, is it breaches relationships. And so we end up feeling alienated, and the symptom is loneliness. I feel so alone. I feel so alone. And some people, you know, are incapable of feeling intimacy. They just can't. Oh, they have sex, but they don't feel the closeness of intimacy. They feel alone. And they feel isolated. And so they're, for some reason, unable to have a heart-to-heart, a soul-to-soul closeness with somebody in a small group or somebody, you know, uh, in their home. And they just feel separated and detached. 
But God is all about healing that and restoring that. Look at what the Bible says. It says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. So he's talking about the root issue. You'll never really solve the human issue and this alienation and the loneliness until you solve the issue with your alienation with God. Now, in America, we celebrate independence. Whoa, that's so cool. You're so independent. But it's also created a generation of people extremely lonely, extremely lonely, feeling alienated, feeling distant. The antidote is Jesus restored me to God. See, Jesus is all about bringing people together. You restore, when you restore, whether it's nations or governments or people, it's two conflicting parties coming together, coming back together. Now, if I say something rude or mean or act in a real mean way to Sharon, there's, there's a problem now. And like I said, we can be in the same house, you know, be in the same, same share the same bed, but there's, there's problems. And I can pretend there's not, but there are. And so it needs to be resolved before the restoration can, before the, we can come back together again. Now, sometimes when somebody hurts me, I, maybe you've done this, where you think, well, you know what, they're the ones that hurt me, so they need to take the initiative. Why would I, you know, go out of my way to try to resolve this? They might hurt me again. You know what I love? That God took the initiative. We're the ones that hurt him, and he took the initiative by sending Christ. It says, now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away from God are brought near Through the blood of Christ's death. It was God who came up with the plan. He says, I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to pay the price. You know what? And and Jesus is going to do that even though some people will reject him. Some people say, I'm not interested in that at all. And for those people, God's effort, his initiative falls flat. Because they don't, no, I'll pass. I don't want that. But God sends a mediator. The Bible talks about Jesus being a bridge, walking across to us, making us restored. You know, that's why, I don't know if you know, but many times if you've heard people pray, they'll pray and and close their prayer with, uh, in Jesus' name. Have you ever heard that? In Jesus' name. You wonder, well, what's that about? Well, some people, they misunderstand that. They think that that is like a magic bullet. Or like a secret spell that when you add that, even though God had no interest and intention on answering your prayer, he has to now. You've kind of like, you know, handcuffed him. Now you have to. I know you didn't want to, but I said this magic phrase. So you have to. That's not what it's about at all. In fact, we say that for us, not for God. We say it because we remind ourselves of what Christ did on the cross. That I know that I am in good standing with God. And so I can go boldly into God's presence. Knowing that he'll listen to me and he wants to answer my prayer. This is a a monumental thing. To know that Jesus restored me to God. And then fourthly, there's just confusion. There's confusion all around. People do not know why they're here on this planet. They don't know their purpose. They're, and, and they're confused about it all. And so the symptom is feeling aimless in life. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't have any goals. I don't have any real plans that matter. I go to the, the gym a few times a week. One of the classes I like to take is a spin class. You're on a little bike that goes nowhere. <laughs> Theoretically, you're getting something out of it. Anyways, about a week and a half ago, it came up, because sometimes we talk, you know, the, 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 the uh, instructor will kind of get a conversation going. Well, she did that. She says, well, why don't we hear about what everybody has as a life goal? Do you know nobody in the room had a life goal? Except me, and then I felt bad, you know, like, <laughs> they're going to probably kick me out, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's why they like the spin class, right? They don't have goals anyway, so they just kind of that, like, they just go there. Like a rocking chair, lots of movement, no, no forward motion. But it is the plight of so many people. I don't know where I'm going. I feel aimless in life. I just live my life, enduring work, live for the weekends, 
hopefully I'll get, you know, I'll some, do party or go somewhere, back to the grind, and then ultimately retire and die, use up resources. No goal. Listen, that is not living. That's existing. That is not living. That's certainly not the way God designed you to live. If you're a Christ follower and you understand how you were created for a purpose, the longer you are a Christ follower, the more temptation there is for you to forget how bad you felt before you were a Christ follower, how miserable it is to live without goals and to have no purpose. I met a guy uh, last week. I was at Costco. I don't know if you know, but I, uh, it helped me get through school. I had a job at Costco actually for nine and a half years. And uh, I, I, I quit it right around the time that I started this church. Sharon and I started the church uh, almost 30 years ago. But I still know some of the people there. I was there last week. I bumped into one of the guys who was there back when I was there. And, uh, you know, he's working. So it just, it's kind of a quick I- exchange. But he goes, hey, Andy, are you thinking of retiring soon? Which means that I look old to him. <laughs> of course, you know what I was thinking about him. But anyway, so he goes, hey, are you thinking of retiring soon? I said, no, man, I love what I do. God's called me to this. I think it's great. And that, by the way, is a message to you in case you're wondering, you know. Thought I'd slip that in there, you know. Try to get rid of this guy, you know. So I said, well, what about you? He goes, well, I've put away a lot of money. I have, I have plenty of money to retire. He goes, but I can't retire. I said, well, why? He goes, because all I do is sit at home, watch TV, and drink. He goes, that's, that's, that's going to be my retirement. So I'm here. I don't like my job a whole lot, but that's my alternative. This is common. This isn't just a one-off. That's people that have no purpose, aimless. It is miserable. They're just existing. Look at what Jesus, what it says Jesus did. He said, Jesus looked over the crowds, looked, surveyed over the people. His heart broke for them. Why? Because they were confused and aimless like sheep without a shepherd. It is terrible to have confusion and aimlessness. That you, you, there's no meaning, real true meaning in your life. Scrambling, looking for little morsels here and there. And it's the 21st century problem. People, and there's no politics or education or the amount of money that will solve it because those don't solve the root issue. What does? Well, Jesus gave me a new identity. A new identity. This is good news. That my past doesn't necessarily dictate my future. Now, I Googled the phrase, changing my identity this past week. Millions, millions of websites. That's, a lot of people are interested in it. Modern Identity Changer is one of the books I found. How to Create a new, and Use a New Identity had a lot of reviews. Here's my favorite, though. Changing my identity and disappearing forever. <laughs> Haven't we all wanted to do that? Like, man, I really need a new start. Is there a good book on that? Well, I guess that this book is getting good reviews. If you want to start all over, disappear forever. But our society is increasingly becoming preoccupied with identity, partly because of identity theft, but also because of this issue that we're talking about. They're confused. They don't know who they are. And in our society, we basically, our identity comes down to these four things. What do I do? What do I have? What do I know and what do I look like? That's it. That's really, in a nutshell, for the world is what your identity amounts to. But that is not who you are supposed to be. That is not your core identity or shouldn't be. You see, you can get new skills. You can even change your name or your social security number. That doesn't change really who you are. But the Bible says God is in, all in on making and giving us new identities. Look at how, what the Bible says. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ. Because of what Christ did, I benefit from that. And I no longer live. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. We live in union as one. And then my, he says, my new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. This is incredible, profound, radical, new person, new beginning, new birth. The Bible says if anyone is enfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new person. The core of who you are, that's your identity. Entirely new person. 
all that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. This is what God promises us. He says, you, this can be you. You can step into something brand new, not manufactured on your own, not something that doesn't you know, uh, connect to the root issue. No, it is the root issue. God saved us because of his mercy and not because of any good things that we have done. He washed us by the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us, notice this, new birth and a fresh beginning. New birth, fresh beginning. What does it mean to be a new creation in Christ? Well, let me just say, this is uh, an issue of faith. This, this is a root issue, a heart issue, but also a faith issue. If, you give your, if you're here today, you've not given your life to Christ, and you decide today, I'm going to give my life to Christ. And you do. You pray to ask Christ into your life. And then you whip out your mirror and look. It's still the same face. Now, you might be thinking, well, I was hoping for something different. <laughs> you know, I was hoping for a new face, kind of a little more, you know, super starry looking. Also, if you give your life to Christ, you're not going to all of a sudden go out to the parking lot and you've got the deluxe car you've always wanted. I don't know what happened, but I gave my life to Christ. New face, brand new car. You go home, you're... The little sign, you don't live here anymore, go to this place. It's a mansion. There's a little person to open up the gate for you. You're waving. Oh, I love Jesus now, man. So glad I did that. Look at all the great things happening to me. Then you go to work and you got a new job. Not the crappy one you hated. This is a great one. That every day is like, whoa, it's awesome. That's not what it is. Be, having a new identity in Christ is like a spiritual metamorphosis where all of a sudden it's more than just positive thinking, although there is positive thinking. It's more than that. If, see, if you just take positive thinking alone, which is actually real positive to have, but positive alone is like taking a caterpillar and, and like taping wings on it. It's not really a, a butterfly. It's a caterpillar that, you know, from a distance it might look like, hey, look, there's a butterfly. You go up, whoa, what's going on here? That's not a butterfly. You become transformed. You have this metamorphosis that happens, and you start experiencing a whole new experience. You no longer are pulled down by all that guilt and the confusion and all the alienation and the loneliness that came with it. You have clarity in your purpose. And life makes sense. Life makes sense once and for all. Look at what the Bible says. Through Christ's death, the power of your sinful nature was shattered. And when God, the Father, with his glorious power, brought him back to life, Jesus was raised from the dead, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. It's not a wonderful new life. It's his wonderful new life. You're starting to live now in sync with God. God I want, to do, I want to do what you want me to do. I want your identity. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was struggling, Lord, here's my will and here's God's will and what do I do? That's an identity question. You know, am I going to once and for all surrender and live what God has for me? And the answer is that's the right way to go. That's why Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. He went to the cross and because of the cross, because of him being raised from the dead, you no longer have to suffer the, from these root causes of feeling worthless and feeling lonely, feeling powerless, feeling aimless in life. Instead, you'll feel loved and valued by God and ultimately by others, but mostly by God. That's what really matters. I feel loved, valued. I feel like... I have purpose in life. God wants to use me. I'm forgiven. Those are powerful feelings. Those are what God wants to change in our lives. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. God has a purpose for you. You're here this morning or you're online listening, but either way, he knew you would be here eons ago so that he could tell you that your, ma your life matters. Maybe you've been told by significant people in your life over the years that you didn't matter. They might not have actually said that phrase, 
But they treated you like you didn't matter. And God is saying, he wants to give you a new identity, a fresh beginning, a fresh start. You don't have to feel worthless or powerless or lonely or aimless. God says, I have a new, fresh life for you, a new beginning. You can do that. Now, if you feel any of those things, you feel far from God, I want to invite you. Today is a moment of truth for you. A moment. You can miss it. People miss it. They do. I wish they didn't, but they do. They miss it all the time. They just say, well, I'll try later. I'll think about it. I want to, you know, maybe next week. And then sometimes the grace isn't there for that. I don't know why. I don't make up the rules. All I know is, is that Next week never comes. It doesn't have to be that way for you. You can do it right now. You don't have to leave here the same person you came in. And if you, if you are a Christ follower, I encourage you to be praying right now because there's people that need the good news of Christ, the power of the living God in their lives to give their life meaning once and for all. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me if that's you. If you're saying, you know what, I, I'm tired of that. No more of feeling guilty and living with compulsions and addictions and feeling alienated from people around me or from God. I don't want to live with aimless confusion anymore. Some of you are saying, this is it, man. I've come to the end of my rope. Who is there to help me? And I am here to tell you, God is here. But you need to take him up on it. You need to say, yes, through prayer, you just, yes, God, I want you in my life. In fact, I'd like to pray with you right now. I'd like to lead you in a prayer for you to reconnect with God. Start that fresh start in your life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, this is a holy moment. Right now, you have a voice in your life that is trying to sabotage you, but you also have the Holy Spirit's voice, whether you recognize it or not, trying to overcome that negative voice. This, And you know, I want you to know people are praying for you. I've been praying for you all week. It's a spiritual thing that's going on. The wrestling, the turmoil, that's a spiritual thing. That's not just your emotions. That's not just your thoughts. Because if you choose to follow Christ, you begin a whole new path. So I want to know if you want to follow me in that prayer. I want to pray for you. If that's you, boldly, right where you're at, just put your hand up, say, Andy, include me in that prayer. Would you do that right now? Okay, bless you. Yep, in the front, in the, on the side. Who else? This is, your, this is it. Don't let this moment pass you by. Okay, I see that. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up right where you're at. Say, include me in that prayer, Andy. I want to pray with you. Okay, bless you. I see that in the back. All right, put your hands down. Follow me in this prayer. Say, God, today I want to give my life to you. I want to trust you. Help me resolve my guilt, my compulsions, my alienation, and my confusion once and for all. You say, God, today, I put my faith in you. I trust you. You say, God, I give you permission to change my soul, my heart. Give me that new identity you talk about and you promise. Then would you say, God, give me the power. I invite the Holy Spirit to come into my life to give me the power to live the life that you've called me to live. Thank you, God. You say, God, thank you for giving me purpose and meaning. Help me to get clarity on that. But I know that you've given me a purpose. I'm not here by accident. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Would you congratulate those who said yes to Jesus, best decision ever, best thing you can ever do. And I want to let you know I am not only proud of you, but I want to pray for you. It means a lot to me. 
and I want to pray for you. That's one of the things. We'll have other people pray, but I want to personally pray for you. Let me know about I can't really specifically pray for you unless you let me know that you prayed with me today. You can do that on the Connect card. It's right in front of you, the seat in back in front of you. Of course, there's a digital way to do it uh, through our QR code if that's easier for you. Let me know about it. Any other prayer requests you might have, you might be here today needing prayer. We have people that at the end of the service will pray for you. Again, you can use the Connect cards for the very same thing. But we have step two, excuse me, step three today, right after the service. As you leave, we'll feed you. We'll watch your kids. We'll feed your kids. And uh, we'd lo- it's only about a... Uh, 50 minutes, something like that, 60 minutes tops, where we just ha- help you uh, further your understanding of who God designed you to be. If you haven't taken step one or two, no worries, no problems. You can still come in. We'd love to have you in there, okay? Remember, next week, we're going to be starting uh, our small group semester. Super excited about that. So you'll want to come prepared to talk to some of the people in the sur- out in the lobby. All of our small group leaders will be there. You can chat with them, talk to them. Find a place where you can say, hey, I'd like to try uh, this small group for this next semester, okay? If you'd like to give to Vineyard, we, uh, we'd love to have your financial support. Thank you for those of you who do. You can do that easily through texting, 45777, and then just put in VCC in the amount. You can do it online, uh, other ways of giving, like uh, the old uh, classic paper check. Whatever it is, thank you, and I certainly want to uh, tell you that it matters, and I love I love joining and co-laboring with you in Christ to further the gospel. Let's stand. We're going to sing one final song, but I want to pray for you before we do. Father, we thank you, Lord, for how your gentle hand steers us and guides us. And that any person, no matter what their situation, no matter even if they got themselves there on their own, still matters to you. You want to change their life. You want to give them a fresh new beginning. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our service. I pray for those online, those in our service who made commitments to you. Father, shower your love and your grace upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.